Hey there, theater aficionados! Welcome to Broadway by Ghostlight. I'm Mark Bonani, and today we're going to look at one aspect of the career of one of the most prolific figures in theater history, producer David Merrick. Merrick. Merrick was responsible for bringing to Broadway shows like Gypsy, Hello Dolly, Carnival, Oliver, Promises, Promises, 42nd Street, and many, many more. How many? How many? How many? Ha! In 1960 alone, David Merrick had an astounding 11 shows playing simultaneously on Broadway. 11! <laughs> 31 of Mr. Merrick's shows were nominated for either Best Play, Musical, or Revival, with seven of those shows bringing home the statue. And when the Tonys had a category for Best Producer... When was that? David Merrick was nominated six times, winning twice, plus... He received two special Tony Awards in 1961 and 1968. Tony, 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 Tony. So what made David Merrick different from other producers at the time? I don't know. You tell me. You're supposed to be the one that has all the answers. You tell me. Well, it certainly wasn't his sunny disposition. Merrick was a legendary tyrant, a devious scoundrel, and an absolute genius. It sounds like a cool guy. It sounds like a jerk. He was often known by his nickname, the Abominable Showman. Abominable! <laughs> Can you believe that? And just like his nickname, he was abominable, but he was also an incredible showman. <laughs> David Merrick is one of my absolute favorite subjects in theater history, and I fully intend to do an in-depth bio on David Merrick sometime uh, soon in the future. I'll believe that when I see it. But today, I just want to focus on one aspect of his genius. One of the things that really set him apart from the others. I'm listening. It's his use of the publicity stunts. <laughs> Not a hoax, a publicity stunt. Merrick would stop at nothing to promote his shows. And he came up with some of the most famous and infamous publicity stunts the theater world has ever known. Infamous? Infamous? He started off small, of course. One of the first plays he ever produced was a comedy called Clutterbuck in 1949. And his idea was to go to all the swanky bars and restaurants and social clubs at the time. Club 96! And have a Mr. Clutterbuck paged constantly uh, until everyone around town was wondering who this Clutterbuck was that was so popular. And while it seems silly, it actually helped the mediocre show run for a lot longer than it probably would have. Oh, I can't believe that worked. The first big musical David Merrick produced on Broadway was the musical Fanny in 1954. But it meant a lot to him that it was a hit, and he pulled out all the stops. Whatever it takes. Here are just some of the stunts he used to promote Fanny. I'm all ears. Merrick petitioned to have the next big hurricane to hit the East Coast named Fanny, but he was informed that all the names for the hurricanes are thought of at the big meeting of the weather bureaus the year before. Missed it by that much. And it was too late to change it now. He was, however, invited to the next year's meeting, which he, of course, heavily publicized. Oh, of course he did. He had stickers placed in all the men's room stalls around the city that said, Have you seen Fanny? Which sounds kind of innocent now, but in 1954 was a little scandalous. Naughty, naughty. For several years, there was a giant ad in Times Square for Bond clothing stores. And this ad featured a real 50,000 gallon waterfall. It was 27 feet high and 120 feet long. And it sat directly across from the Astor Hotel, which no longer exists. So Merrick's idea was to rent a hotel room across from the ad and use a projector to project an ad for Fanny onto the cascading waterfall. He got away with it for a few nights, but he made the mistake of inquiring at the hotel about the wiring in the rooms, which caused management to get a little suspicious. And when they investigated and found out the operation, Merrick and his men were ejected from the hotel. At the wedding of Grace Kelly to the Prince of Monaco, arguably one of the biggest celebrity events of the 20th century, Merrick had the audacity to hire a skywriter to write a big ad for Fanny in skywriting right above the ceremony. 
Skywriting isn't always positive. In yet another ploy to publicize Fanny, David Merrick made sure to cast famed belly dancer and gossip columnist sweetheart Najla Atish. And her part was extremely small. She was only on stage for about a minute, but Merrick had much grander things in mind. He commissioned a sculptor to create a life-size nude statue of Atesh, which he then installed late in the middle of the night, without permission, of course, in Central Park. Then, early in the morning, David Merrick made several complaints to both the police and the press, uh, complaining about the vulgar statue. And sure enough, it worked. The statue itself and the taking down of the statue created waves of publicity. It's a completely naked statue! And he also uh, ended up installing a giant 12-foot picture of Vatesh in front of the theater, which reportedly caused more than a few traffic accidents. <laughs> All that publicity helped Fanny run at the Majestic Theater for 888 performances. Well, I'm a fanny man myself. In 1987, one of Merrick's biggest hits, 42nd Street, had been playing for seven years and was beginning to lose steam. The show had recently moved to its third theater, the St. James, after being kicked out of the Majestic to make room for the incoming big mega-hit, Phantom of the Opera. Merrick would also publicize that by having the cast in full costume tap dance their way outside of the Majestic, across the street, and into the St. James. Always the showman. He's the greatest showman since that kid who eats worms. So with his show lagging and the mega-hit Phantom raking them in, he was watching the box offices one night and got a brilliant idea. He changed the show times to 42nd Street to 8.15 on weeknights and 2.15 on matinees, and then ran ads all over the city saying, David Merrick is holding the curtain for you. For me! For me! The idea being that anyone who couldn't get a ticket for Phantom could just hop on right across the street to the St. James and still have time to buy a ticket for 42nd Street. Genius. One of the most legendary and brilliant, or devious, depending on who you ask, stunts ever pulled in the theater was an infamous newspaper ad placed by David Merrick to promote Subways Are For Sleeping in 1961. It opened at the St. James Theater to disappointing reviews, and ticket sales were slow and only getting slower. There's only 8,000 tickets left. <laughs> the New York City Transit Authority had already put the kibosh on Merrick's plan to flood the subways with ads. Put the kibosh on my deal. Now I'm going to put the kibosh on you. Fearing that big ad saying Subways Are For Sleeping would in effect give every homeless person in the city permission to sleep in the subway system, Merrick knew he had to do something big, and he had just the plan. What diabolical plan? Merrick scoured the United States for anyone with the same names as the top seven New York theater critics at the time, like Howard Taubman and Walter Kerr. He then flew them all out to New York first class, wined and dined them, gave them prime seats to the show, and afterwards presented them with prefabricated statements gushing about the show and asked if they agreed, which they of course were happy to do. I think we can all agree on that, right? Merrick then took out a large ad in the New York papers that boldly claimed seven out of seven are ecstatically unanimous for Subways Are For Sleeping. The ad then quotes these seven men with things like, wow, best show of the century, greatest show I've ever seen, what a hit, and things like that. As to not be accused of any wrongdoing, Merrick did include pictures of the seven actual people next to their quotes, uh, knowing full well that almost nobody knew what these critics actually looked like. Look at me and tell me who I am. But the newspapers did, and almost none of them ran the ad, except for the Herald Tribune, which somehow let it slip in their early edition. It caused quite the firestorm. It might be a bit of an exaggeration. Merrick actually confessed later in life that he had that stunt in his back pocket for years before using it, but he couldn't find anyone with the same name as Brooks Atkinson. That's an interesting name. Is it? So he had to wait until Atkinson retired 
so he could finally pull off this stunt. Finally! While David Merrick's stunts were always very clever and a little cheeky, this next stunt was by far his most cruel. I don't like the sound of that. David Merrick worked with famed Broadway director and choreographer Gower Champion seven times, including on 42nd Street, which would be Gower Champion's final show. On August 25th, 1980, the day of 42nd Street's opening night, David Merrick got a call in the early hours that Gower Champion was in the hospital and not doing well. Champion had been diagnosed the year before with a rare blood cancer. A small group of doctors and family, as well as Merrick, was there at the hospital when at 1 p.m. Champion sadly passed away. Not wanting to ruin his opening night, and of course wanting to milk the situation for all it was worth, Merrick sprang into action. He immediately swore the doctors and family members to secrecy about what had happened. He then called the full company into rehearsals all day to insulate them from the possible rumor mill. The plan worked and 42nd Street's opening night went off without a hitch. As the cast was taking their bows to thunderous applause, David Merrick took the stage looking sullen. When the crowd finally calmed down, he said, it's very tragic to which everyone laughed, thinking that it was a joke, seeing as how they just had a triumphant opening. But he then broke the news to the absolutely stunned and heartbroken cast, the gasping audience members, and of course the full row of news cameras in the back of the theater that Merrick made sure were there for his big announcement. <laughs> stunt worked and ensured the show would have a long and profitable run, many thought this latest stunt by Merrick was inexcusable. Many years later, the show's star Wanda Riker confronted David about that incident and she asked him if he knew actually how crass and disgusting it was. And he said that he did, but he just couldn't help himself. And that's a brief look into the mind of David Merrick. Sorry to end on Kind of a downer there. <laughs> what did you think? What was your favorite publicity stunt that he pulled off? Has a show that you've ever been a part of ever done a publicity stunt? I'd actually really love to know down in the comments. Please be sure to give this video a big thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and hit that bell if you haven't already, and share this with the tyrannical genius in your life. Thank you all so much for watching. This is Broadway by Ghostlight. I'm Mark Benani. I'll see you all next time.